First and foremost, congratulations to Cendana and PFAA on the successful organization of the Kuala Lumpur Creative Economy Forum 2021. KKMM has been working closely with Cendana and My Creative Ventures in addition to other agencies to champion the creative economy. Developing our creative economy requires effort not only from the government but also from the private sectors and in ensuring we employ the best strategies for growth, we truly have to consider a more creative and innovative approach. With that in mind, it is an honour for me to introduce Mr. Jason Bevan, the former Head of Creative Development and VP Marketing for EMEA at Warner Bros Studios, also the Founder and Managing Director of Content Creative Studios, to share his address on thinking exponentially for the creative economy. Jason Bevan was responsible for the innovation and creativity process at Warner Bros Studios, marketing legendary movies in EMEA from the Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts film and the Dark Knight trilogy to the Lego movies. Jason's keynote and classes are packed with inspiration from 16 years working in the movie world and show why creativity continues to be one of our most valuable skills. Jason has worked with teams in 37 countries at WB and was known for his passion for pushing creative boundaries on campaigns across all movie genre. Jason also worked for Disney in London and Paris and continues to work with top film and entertainment companies as co-founder of Content Creator Studios. Thank you very much, Dato Sri, and welcome to you all at Chendana. Um, I'm Jason Bevan. I ran the marketing and creative development process at Warner Brothers Studios in Amir. Um, I worked on most of the Harry Potter films, the Fantastic Beasts fil films, Dark Knight, The Joker, The It, the horror movies, the Hangover movies, um, and lots of the Christopher Nolan movies too, like Dunkirk and Inception. Um, I spent most of my career developing bold, out-of-the-box creative solutions and working with some of the most creative filmmakers um, and marketeers to develop campaigns and ideas that really did have significant cultural impact. Most importantly, though, um, I saw what lessons we can learn from those very, very creative people and how we can apply them to our own jobs. So I'm going to talk you through some tips for how to bring creativity more into your culture, um, using lots of examples from films that I've worked on. Um, and um, I'm also going to ask you a few questions to think about the way that you think. How do you think creatively and how could you think differently and push yourself um, to be more dynamic and more brave and bold um, in creativity within your organisation? Um, but first of all, I'm just going to show you a couple of quick um, clips of some of the movies that I've worked on and why I think some of them are so creative. They're watching us. Focus me. Huh? All eyes on us. Bring the action. You gotta turn the shit up. You gotta turn the shit up. All eyes on us. All eyes on us. They watching us. They watching us. And shout and let it all out and scream and shout and let it out and say no. You are now, now. I have a big idea. <laughs> Brace for impact. All eyes on us. All eyes on us. They watching us. They watching us.
There's nothing like the aftermath of a serious crisis, though, to spur innovation, because just like the end of the First and the Second World Wars gave rise to a renaissance of ideas and activities all over the world, just so the exit from the pandemic and everything that it's caused for us is a massive opportunity for us to recreate ourselves and our organisations with fresh thinking. Um, the Nobel winning economist um, Milton, Fried Milton Friedman said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are available at the time. Well, there is absolutely no doubt that we um, have come out, are now coming out of a real crisis. So now let's do everything we possibly can to make something positive out of it. Because we're now at a critical junction where we can do one of two things. We can ignite our way out of this crisis, just like Tesla did with their space program and their new electric cars. Or you can fizzle out, just like some of these brands unfortunately did during um, the pandemic and the depths of it. Ignoring the need to innovate is simply not an option because exposing the failure of people that have been unwilling to recreate themselves has been a sadly poignant reality of the virus. With all the adversity and challenges that are facing us at the moment, it really is that stark. If you don't fully and culturally commit to keep creating, the chances of your own organization or perhaps even more scary still, the chances of your own career being alive and thriving in 10 years time are slashed. Um, the Conf Confederation for British Industry here in the UK have told us that 90% of us are gonna need to find fundamentally new skills in the next nine years. And that was also the, the conclusion of the World Economic Forum recently in Davos as well. And a big reason for that obviously is artificial intelligence because it's gonna keep chasing us humans and competing with our skills. Its analysis and processes of efficiency and everything, its speed and ease, decreased costs are just going to continue to strengthen. But the ability to be creative is one of the biggest and most important things that we have over artificial intelligence as humans. So if we want to ensure that our careers and our jobs and our organizations are boosted by technology and not consumed by it, we better focus on those skills that we have over AI. Because in fact, if you go right back to human innovation as its very earliest stages, anthropologists have consistently seen almost without exception that the tribes who survive are the ones that embrace change and innovation. The ones that haven't have unfortunately simply ceased to exist. Because we're now in an age where the courage of people like this young lady addressing the UN on climate change when she was 16 exposes the sad and sheer tragic timidity of people that just resign themselves to conform and be the same as everybody else. Well, I'm sorry if that sounds a little bit chilling because here's where things get much more cheery and optimistic, I promise. I was lucky enough to work on some of those incredible movies, some of the world's best loved ones, in fact, with some of the biggest studios and filmmakers and cast that made them. And I saw that there's so much creative inspiration that we can use from those iconic movies and the people that were responsible for them. And there's a mountain of scientific proof that we're usually better at doing something when we're enjoying it. We can bring back passion and creativity into our work um, by making our places more creative. Happy places are generally much more creative and vice versa, creative places are much more happy. We know that being happy re scientifically releases the dop dopamine, the reward drug into our heads and that helps us focus and develop ideas. But on the flip side of that, this is a film I worked on called The Nun in the Conjuring series from James Wan. Um, we simply can't be creative when we're under threat or scared of being shot down. It just doesn't work. And what that means is that unfortunately, 86% of the ideas in the workplace stay silent. Many of them are just due to self-doubt and what others might think. Don't be one of them. So here's an example of real brave creativity from film that I saw. Cast your minds back a little bit a few years ago to when superheroes were just those guys that we all idolized. They had big muscles, they were serious, they were cool looking, um, and they were just totally unflinching. And then think of the guts and huge risk that it took a big studio like Fox that are now part of Disney to come up with Deadpool's shockingly un-PC one-liners. His naked body, his, all of the terribly inappropriate things that he said and did. But why did they do that? It wasn't just to make the film more funny. They did it because the holy grail in film 
is to transcend the genre that your audience has traditionally appealed to and make it into what we call a four quadrant movie, where a much bigger, wider audience come to see your film. A certain type of person has always been to go and see superhero films and they love them. But of course they wanted a bigger audience because bigger audiences mean more profit. I can tell you that cutting humor brought more new audiences into superhero movies than they could have ever dreamed. Disney in fact totally recreated a lot of its studio fortunes on the back of the success of Marvel and their punchy funny one-liners from people like Robert Downey Jr. Now being brave and being more creative is really quite basic. When we're children, we're born with minds that have natural open door thinking. I have three young children and they're constantly thinking on a different way that I am without rules and inhibitions. But then as they get to go into school and we start to get into rules and regulations and laws, we start to think within much more, much more strict confines in boundaries, especially in big organizations. And instead of expanding our ideas and bringing them out into what they could be, we start to reduce them. Um, and look for weaknesses so that we don't look silly in front of other people when we come up with ideas. And I call this train track thinking. That's why I'm showing you these train tracks in front of you. If we innovate, we tend to tweak and adapt a little bit, making things a little bit better. When actually what we really need to do is to go into the much scarier world of truly open door thinking off those train tracks and really take the handbrake off. It doesn't have to mean changing sector or industry and what we do, but it does mean being brave enough to seriously reassess what we've, what we've done and the way that we've done it to get into what I call exponential thinking. Walt Disney himself was brilliant at being an exponential thinker. He refused to accept the traditional rules of animation. And what you can see here is something called the multiplane camera that he developed. And that was where the scenes of the movie were stacked on different frames to give the shot added depth. When Bambi was shot, that's, that's, this is exactly what they used. But then he went further. He wanted scent sprayed onto people. Um, and he wanted um, all sorts of other effects like wind and noise all in the cinema with you. And in fact, so obsessed did he become with plunging his audiences into this real life movie experience. Remember, this was this is 80 years before we'd even come up with anything like 3D or 4DX that some people now have in cinemas. So obsessed did he become with plunging people into this film environment that he realized that he needed real places, characters that you could interact with on live sets where those characters lived. And suddenly Disneyland was born. And that was a legitimate game changer that introduced the multi-billion dollar concept of the theme park into the world. I would say that was pretty great open door thinking. In fact, years later, when I was working for Disney, we actually turned it around the other way and took some of the theme park rides like Pirates of the Caribbean and made that into the multi-billion dollar film franchise with Jack Sparrow the Pirate. You may have seen Jungle Cruise coming out recently, which is also a theme park ride from Disney um, that they made into a great film with, um, with Dwayne Johnson. Another rule that filmmaking chose to ignore to its huge benefit. Cars in movies traditionally had, to look, ha, um, had two axles and amongst other things, they had, were finished in spray paint and lacquer. They look cool, they have fun gadgets like the bomb cars that we've just seen in No Time to Die. But that was incremental thinking. Think of the time traveler, the DeLorean from Back to the Future as well. When I was starting out at Warner Brothers, Chris Nolan and Nathan Crowley really looked, refused to accept this with the, birth of, the rebirth of the Batmobile and the Dark Knight trilogy. They created a totally different look of car for that movie. And they actually used a plastic toy modeling kit in Chris's garage in LA. Um, but on a much simpler level, it also had two fundamental differences from other cars. It had no front axle and it was finished in, in matte black paint. They really fundamentally rethought the look and feel of a, of a car. That was exponential open door thinking. The first time I saw this thing, I knew it was gonna be amazing. It was on a very confidential protected film set um, that no, no one was allowed to see it. Um, and I realized how big this could be. And I asked if we could tour it and publicize it in film fairs all over the world. And we got an enormous amount of coverage. The film went down fairly well. And certainly by the time The Dark Knight came out, it actually was the biggest movie of all time in the domestic, uh, domestic box office in the US. But much more interestingly, Soon, many of the world's privately owned supercars started, started sporting matte black paint. And some of them even had flaming tailpipes, just like the Batmobile. And that was a true example and firm proof that we had pervaded global culture and made a change wherever you were in the world. 
I'd also like to ask you a question. Do you sometimes feel tired at the end of the day when you've got through stuff, you've got through your inbox, you've got through your diary, but you don't really feel like you've challenged your brain? And there's a very simple reason for that. And that is because most of our working day is spent in the 13% of our brain that is just we use to get stuff done, to be efficient, just move fast and get through everything. And that means that 82% of our brain, which is the subconscious part of our brain, that's where most of our ideas come from. And that's the bit that we need to get into when we ideate. And the reason I call it open door thinking is that um, we need to open that door into that subconscious part. Um, and that is the best route to getting really creative. Um, I've developed this presentation with a clinical psychologist, and this is scientifically proven to be correct. Because that efficiency keeps us within those lines, on those train tracks, in those running, in the, in the correct lines in your running track. In fact, we become so used to the areas that we're operating in that we don't even know the lines are there anymore. We stay in these familiar, cozy areas of thinking um, inside the lines where we're happy. Um, and that means for people also, particularly on large organizations, on comfortable salaries, even more so. And with so much going on in the working day, we can very rarely be creative in this just executional 13% of our brain. I would also ask you, are you really happy when you think of the fact that actually the majority of your working life, you're only using 13% of your brain? That really doesn't feel comfortable. Here's another really good example in filmmaking where they dared to be really new again from Disney. Animated films had to be traditionally for children, right? This is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and it was the first animated feature film that came out, the full length that was in cinemas. That was in 1937. But it seemed actually that even Walt didn't know everything because when Pixar was Steve Jobs um, and John Lasseter came along with Toy Story, they broke the mold with adult humor and animation. Remember when Buzz Lightyear's wings popped out when he saw Jesse the cowgirl for the first time? Now that was a little bit naughty, but it was also a hugely brave move from Disney, um, who had been so associated with pure family entertainment in the past. But it was an absolute game changer for animation because rather than those traditional family audiences coming to see animated movies, suddenly adults and other people that were out of that traditional sector realized that there was also a movie there for them that was funny. There was a film for the children. There was a film for the adults on top of it. And that shift allowed them to multiply by many times the size of the audience is going to see animated films, just as they did with superhero movies. And that means that now the big animated films regularly surpass more than a billion dollars at the box office when they first open. And P.S. It also made Steve Jobs and Pixar into a multi-billion dollar company um, and net worth in, in a few years time as well. Another film more recently, actually, that did the same thing in a very different way was Joker. That was a film that I was lucky enough to work on. That was a legitimate creative groundbreaker about terrible mental illness and destitution and rejection by society. When again, even the funny superhero movies of like Iron Man um, and some of the other ones that we've just talked about, they were all set in quite glamorous settings. Joker was in a very grungy, depressing environment, but it was still a great film. It was a massive communications risk. I can tell you at Warner Brothers, we were very, very worried about that film and some of the feedback that we may get from it, particularly in the context of positive mental health um, that's been going on for, um, and the news attention that that's had over the last few years. But also there's another lesson to tell from the, what the joke is saying, um, his facial expression here, is that when we actually really go for that open door exponential thinking, it's probably gonna feel a bit forced, just like the joker is trying to force his smile here. When you do this incremental thinking where it's just adaptions of things that we've already thought of before, that's much easier. Um, but actually at the beginning for exp exponential thinking, you're gonna go through a difficult phase where it's gonna feel uneasy and very difficult, and particularly for the, um, when, you, when you're working with senior people in your organization. Um, before we get to that real gold where we start to break into fundamentally new ideas, um, we're going to get to that stage where lots and lots of where people will find um, the thinking very, very challenging. And you can't necessarily see over that hill um, into the brilliance of the ideas that you can get to when you fundamentally change gear. And that often means that 90 percent of the brilliance of an idea can come in the final 10 percent of the time that you're thinking about it. So you really do have to have confidence to be able to get through that difficult stage earlier on. So many films that we saw over the years like this had a similar creative process. I can tell you the first time that we saw um, some of the Hobbit trilogy films, we had a lot of concerns about them, but we stuck with it and the filmmakers stuck with it and they kept changing and adapting them to making them into the legendary movies that they became. 
So I'm now going to give you 10 clear tips as to how you can now translate some of this brilliance from the film world and really adapt it and, and put it into your own thinking on a day-to-day -day level when you're working because it's proven that our brains are neuroplastic and that they do adapt um, and can be creative if we push them that way. Just like training your muscles, the brain, your brain is another big, another muscle that we need to train and adapt and make, keep to make sure we keep it on edge. Um, do you feel though that creativity is actually one of your biggest strengths as an individual? Now, normally if we had time and I was able to ask, ask people questions and get, a, get the feedback from them, we find that most people don't. And that's a real shame because you really, one of the, my first tips is believing you can do it. We all need to believe in ourselves and that we are creative because creativity is inside all of us every day. Socrates here believed that he had a spiritual demon that would come to him. The Renaissance put humans at the center of everything and that the inspiration would come to them. Well, Socrates may have been genuinely brilliant at his time, but things have moved on a bit now since then. And I think it's genuinely accepted that if you want stuff to happen, you've got to go with it. You've got to make it happen. And you need to have to invite that inspiration demon into your head. You need to proactively believe and tempt it in by making, by feeling that you can, you can do it, that you can be creative with true courage and self-belief. Innovation is not going to hit us passively. You have to go after it with grit and ambition and determination. But above all bravery, some of you may, may remember these guys that were actually pretty unknown before The Hangover came out. But in that film as well, in the baseball cap is Todd Phillips. He had the bravery during production to come and ask the studio. He wanted another $10 million. The studio declined and said, no, if we give you that 10 million, you need a bigger, better, much more global name in your, um, in your movie. Todd said that he really believed in his cast, who were pretty much unknown at the time. And so what he said to them is that he would cut his director's fee down to almost nothing if he could get that $10 million. But when Warner Brothers got to the level they needed in box office to justify that extra investment, he would then take 15% of the net. Todd Phillips netted almost $70 million from the Hangover series because that film was such a breakout success and he had the true bravery to believe in himself. The second one is all about being yourself and committing emotionally. When you're developing ideas, be truly you and accept that we're all different and we're gonna come up with different stuff. Frank, focus on your strengths and skills and accept that everybody else is gonna focus on, focus, come up with different stuff that's fundamentally, that's, all, that's right across the spectrum in terms of ideas. And that's a great thing because we're all different. Accept that that is gonna be part of the process. Let colleagues go, you, go their own way. Um, we all have lots of different ways that we like to ideate. Some people like to do it in groups with, um, with, it, uh, with, lots of, with lots of different ideas coming from all sorts of areas of the room. Other people like to go off and do it on their own, and that's all fine. Let people do that and uh, find their own route in developing ideas, because we've all got our own idiosyncrasies. Einstein actually said that it was important to foster individuality because only the individual can produce new ideas. But I'd also like to come to, before we come to another tip, I'd like to ask you about barriers to creativity because this is also really important. What do you think the key barriers are that are stopping you and your organization from coming up with ideas? One of the things that most people say most often is it's all about their bosses. Because to be inspired, we need to have the support, feel like we've got the support of the people that are above us and cut through and get into that, taking the risks bit so that, um, so that we can get into that really bold new thinking. And that means for bosses, ensuring that your team stay true to core principles and values of your company, but that we also accept that sometimes not all of our ideas are going to work. In film, like most industries, 90% of the profits often come from 10, 5 or 10% of what we're putting into the market. That by definition means that we must have a lot of films that are underperforming. And that's fine because that's a natural and important part of the creative process. And that all needs to be backed up by a spirit of dynamism and empowered decision taking. Because this little baby tiger knows that he's got very little chance of catching those small, agile, darting little fish that can move quickly. And that's what we need to do in our organizations. Think quickly and move quickly. Because if there was a larger, much, more, much uh, fatter moving trap that came along, he'd have a much better chance of catching it. Tip number four is all about idea, time, making time to think. 50% of us spend less than 30 minutes or 6% of the working week um, just without actually the time to think. So um, we, have, we need to make time to actually be able to come out and think, be at our lunch break or another time for focus with, less focus, with much more focus and less noise. 
Um, have allocated time set aside for thinking as a team, as an individual or as a company. And that also means, by the way, looking up from your cell phones and powering down, because otherwise you're going to lack focus and clarity in your thinking. The digital world is great for sharing ideas and getting inspiration, but it's also so, uh, um, it can also be damaging to the idea process if we don't really focus and concentrate on the ideas when we're doing it at the time. This one here, I'm, why am I showing you British, um, the British Prime Minister here, former British Prime Minister Theresa May? This is all about getting comfortable being uncomfortable. When you come up, unfortunately for Theresa, this, um, this, turned, this wasn't a great move for her career at the time. But the other message in it is that if you feel uncomfortable when you're coming up with an idea, that's often a really good sign. Um, because that means that you're leaving those train tracks of thought. And it's that excited nervousness that we get in our bellies um, when we come up with a new idea. So make sure that that's, if that's a good part of the process, then uh, focus on it and make sure that you know, does that idea make you feel a little bit excited and nervousness? Competition is another good thing in ideation, but it's got to be friendly competition. We need to be encouraging each other to, come to, um, uh, to develop new ideas and develop positivity on what we're doing. Too much of it, it can focus on shooting down good thinking um, and building up barriers. We all want to use our own ideas. But an idea can't be owned by just one individual alone. It needs to be a collective team effort, because if it's all about one person, then the chances of that idea surviving plummet. The idea wins the day, not the head that it came from. You may even have to convince other people that it was their idea to be able to get an idea through and approved. Idea number seven is all about grounding your thinking in solid customer insight before you start the idea process. Make sure that you have a really clear brief and really understand what your customers want and exactly what's going to push their buttons, because otherwise your creative brilliance can end up just being totally channeled down the wrong place um, and really no, it will not have too much worth at the end of the day. Also, a blank canvas is a very hard place to start. Listen to the customers, listen to the people that you're working for and make sure you focus your ideas around what they want. And then the, the idea number eight is all about positivity. Develop positive inertia. This is Jim Carrey, a film that we worked on where he had to say yes to everything. Say yes and in meetings. That doesn't mean saying something is, is great when you believe, don't believe that, that, it, that it is, but it does mean giving that positive inertia. Um, rationalize the ideas that you're coming up with another day. We'll be able to put them into a hopper and funnel down the ones that actually end up getting used. But when you're ideating, give that spirit of positivity, the yes and rather than the no but culture. The Harry Potter films were absolutely brilliant at this. They were the ones, they were the only ones I ever went on that actually where the sets could truly call themselves a family. And that meant that so much of that was because children were on set and they needed to make them feel comfortable. They created that warmth and friendliness on set. Film sets are not necessarily no, known um, for their, their relaxed, friendly atmospheres. A lot of film sets, you feel like you're treading on eggshells, but on the Harry Potter ones, they were great warm environments. And look at the creativity that that, that, that magic and warmth created. Um, they were some of the warmest, most friendly places I've ever been to. Um, and so, and I really think that that's an important lesson for us. Um, for my own part, actually, those film sets inspired me to realise that we should tour the Hogwarts Express all over Europe. And we did that with the animals and cast from the film sets inside the carriages. And lo and behold, when we actually bought the train to, the, to Paris for the first time to open it, we had a one and a half kilometre queue to um, wait line to be able to get on board that train. The idea number nine is all about mixing with other people from lots of different skills and skills and departments for creative collisions. Sometimes we're too close to our own work to see through. Things that should have been extremely obvious can end up being pointed out to us by people that are nothing to do with our line of work or in totally different departments, areas of the company or other organisations that we really traditionally don't work with. It's moments when people say, why don't you do this? And you suddenly think, well, actually, that's so basic. We should have thought of it, but we really didn't. Harrison Ford was one of those on, on set. He actually was a carpenter and just kept, kept suggesting great ideas. And you can see what happened to his career. And that also goes further from, um, for, to bring variety for the people in the room exchanging ideas. Just as film sets are, can never be, films can never be packed with the constant cast of, um, of big action superheroes. That means getting lots of different people from backgrounds and different um, um, ideologies, races, religions into the room. That is a really good, healthy thing. A lot of people are talking so much about diversity these days, and it's so important when you're developing ideas. At Warner Brothers, many of our teams, are 30% um, uh, of our teams in the room were, were interns, and that was because people between the ages of 15 and 30 are the most common movie-going audience. 
And we wanted to keep the ideas young and fresh in the room. So make sure that we're, we're really keeping that breadth and scope of people when we're developing ideas. And another moment is also to think about as well from film sets. We actually came up with, um, we were able to develop a lot of great ideas from film sets by changing the environments that we were in. Um, Einstein was, um, was actually in a, um, he, was, he, he was out in a boat when he came up with the idea of relativity. Um, and actually Da Vinci as well sat, it was by stream outside when he came up um, with some of his best thinking. And Tesla, and I'm not talking about Elon Musk and his electric vehicles, um, saw the electric motor when he, he was in his head when he was in a park. And Joe Rowling was in a coffee shop in Edinburgh when she created the story of this underdog, a little boy um, recruited for, um, for his cupboard under the stairs to Hogwarts Castle. Um, that was one of the most powerful entertainment franchises of all time. And lastly, this is Crystal the monkey from The Hangover, from um, one of our premieres that reminds me that whatever you do, just have fun. Because it, 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 you do not have to be serious to solve serious issues. Ideating is a fun, uplifting process. Let's do more of it. Because without ideas in the, uh, good ideas in the world, a truly chilling thing happens to us. And it's a cold, horrible, icy feeling. And that's nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for that sharing session. There are questions that have been raised here. Please allow me to ask the first question here. The first question, from your experience, what drives international producers and investors to a destination for collaboration, investment and work? Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. I think it's, very, it's really very much about three different factors for filmmakers when they're deciding whether or not to invest in a country and make a big film there. It's all about investment, resources, and expertise. It's those three big poles. And what does that mean? Well, and from the investment side of things, I'm talking about that in the wider sense of the financing of the movie. And does the country that you're going to really make it easy and rewarding financially to be there? That obviously can, can mean tax incentives, um, but it also means making sure that there's a financially friendly environment um, for them to operate in, um, of real efficiency and being able to produce a movie um, inexpensively. So and that or the government can obviously make a huge difference in that, uh, with that, as we've seen in many other countries around the world. Secondly, resources. Um, so again, specifically, what does that mean? That is natural resources. So in Malaysia, with the incredibly, the really beautiful country that you have there, renowned internationally for the quality of your beaches and coastlines and islands, but also tropical environments, also the, globe, the, um, the architecture and the cities that you have that look so fantastic with some amazingly iconic architecture that you have in Malaysia. Um, but it also goes further than that as well, from your natural resources through to other physical things that people need to be able to make movies. So sound stages, studios, facilities, editing, all of these other things um, that it's much easier for people to, uh, to have all in one place when you come to make a movie. So those resources are really very important. And the last thing is expertise, because when people are making a movie, um, they need all sorts of different skills from lots of different areas. Um, and that's not just about the things that you traditionally associate with making a movie. Um, obvious things like makeup and costuming and designing sets, those are all really important and, and bring in lots of different skills. Think about when you're, <clears throat> when you're seeing a set and you see the way that things have been aged to look in a specific way, those are really very, very skilled people that are able to do that. But it's also lots of other things as well. There's lots of tech aspects to a film, of course, now with all of the visual effects um, that are being brought in and animation, um, but special effects as well. Um, and um, so there's all, all of that really diverse range of expertise and skills that people need to be able to make movies. And the last thing um, is um, in, in general, just everything together needs to fit in and be easy for people to do easy for people to travel. What are, your tra what are your connections coming in like? When they're there, is it a good experience for the cast? Is it a good, easy experience for the filmmakers? Um, and I think that's something that, you, again, that you're very, very strong on in Malaysia. You have an amazing reputation for warm hospitality, um, for good compliance standards and auditing procedures um, that are similar to those, of, um, those of, that we um, use in respect in the, uh, in the West. And so that will be a conducive, warm environment. Um, for fil filmmakers to be able to come into and operate in. And that will, all, that, all of those things will be really important to them. Here's another question. What are the opportunities for Malaysia to funnel its talent pipeline to mature creative ecosystem globally? Well, I think it's a lot of the things that, we've, that I've just discussed in my presentation. It's about being bold and creative. It's about 
breaking free from the traditional associations that people may have of Malaysia. In the West, where we're making a lot of, where a lot of the big movies are coming from, what does that mean? Well, we will definitely associate Malaysia with warm hospitality and your fantastic tourism industry, because that's an experience a lot of us have had. We would also definitely, I'm sure, I'm sure for the most part, associate Ma Malaysia with good technological levels of innovation. But in the wider sense, we may not necessarily associate Malaysia with other areas of creativity. And that's why I'd really congratulate you on things like Chandana, where you're bringing people together um, to be able to ideate and to be able to bring your ideas into a, into a room or a place together to be able to exchange ideas and develop and focus on creativity because I really do passionately believe that along with data insight, certainly in marketing, creativity and data insight and understanding your customers are two of the most important things. They are the holy grail going forward. Um, a great example of where you did that was, of course, Crazy Rich Asians. And that was a film that I worked on it quite extensively. And again, that was another film where that was an example of real risk. We had huge concerns about what the perception of that film would be, particularly in Southeast Asia. We've either, it, it, we, our concern was that it, would be, it, that it was a very cliched view of a certain uh, area of society um, from Asian countries that people in those countries may view as a little, that, that would, may not necessarily be, take, um, take especially kindly to, because of course you're so much more than a lot of the bling brands and things and that type of that part of society um, that's portrayed in the film. But the film went down very well. It was a creative risk. Some people may have disliked the film, just as, just as they, some people may have disliked Joker when it first came out or some of the really bold superhero movies when they came out as well. Not everyone's gonna like your idea, but the point is you have to go into new areas to take risks, um, to be able to get into, into places that are gonna really push your creativity um, and productivity um, forward in the future. And I think Crazy Rich Asians was a really good example of that. And of course, it's made a, made a big star um, out of some Malaysian people um, that are in, the, that are in the, print, the principal cast like Henry Golding. Um, and I really do wish him very uh, wish him well on his future career um, and all the other people that were associated with that movie. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for this. We hope to see you in Malaysia soon. To the rest of the audience, please enjoy the rest of the forum and stay safe.